can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Here are the facts. Public opinion is big business. As of 2011, there were more than 7,000 public relations firms in the United States alone. These companies work on behalf of corporations, trade organizations, or individuals who hope to put a positive spin on their image. Whether it's a celebrity trying to salvage his or her reputation after a meltdown, a musician promoting an album, or a business combating negative press, chances are you've recently encountered PR work and you might not have known. There's no denying the importance of this multi-billion dollar industry, but what exactly is it? How does it work? And who invented it? Here's where it gets crazy. The art of modern public relations can be generally traced to one man, Edward Bernays. There were other, earlier innovators, but none altered the social landscape of North America as profoundly. Born in Vienna, Austria in 1891, Bernays' family moved to New York City about a year after his birth. He was the nephew of Sigmund Freud, and like his uncle, Bernays was captivated by the convoluted processes of the human mind. Bernays often consulted his uncle's work, and he was the first to incorporate psychology and other social sciences into PR. Yet where Freud sought to uncover motivations, Bernays sought to mask them, and Bernays' clients were companies rather than individuals. For example, one of his early cases involved Lucky Strike cigarettes in the 1920s. The American tobacco company asked him to expand sales. Women would be an ideal market, but there were problems. First, women didn't care for the green packaging of Lucky Strikes, and the manufacturer concluded that changing the color was too expensive. Second, it was taboo for women to smoke in public. Bernays took a unique approach to these obstacles. First, he recommended that if the packs must stay green, they should make green the premier color of the fashion season. During his Green Ball campaign, Bernays convinced French designers to incorporate green into their latest fashion lines, and not just any green, but the specific dark green shade of Lucky Strike packaging. He also engineered a green gala at the Waldorf Astoria, featuring some of society's most prominent tastemakers. To address the problem of smoking in public, he linked Lucky Strike cigarettes to the women's liberation movement, arranging for young women to march down Fifth Avenue, smoking and calling the cigarettes torches of freedom. Instead of appearing to sell cigarettes, this seemingly spontaneous march appeared to be a part of the struggle for gender equality. Suddenly, Lucky Strike cigarettes didn't just have packaging that matched the latest Parisian fashions, they also made a statement about women's equality. It's easy to see how these associations could skew market opinion, and the campaign was enormously successful. If you're like most people, then you probably assume that you know where your opinions come from. And if you're like most people, you're probably wrong. Humans tend to think of each belief as the result of a rational analysis, but this is not entirely true. Instead, our opinions are subtly influenced in numerous ways, and we're often not aware of this process. Edward Bernays tapped into this phenomenon to increase the sales of hairnets, cigarettes, bacon, and more, but that's just the beginning. He didn't restrict his talents to selling consumer goods. He persuaded consumers and citizens to approve of several other things, and that's probably something his clients don't want you to know. Even today. Tune in next week for more on Bernays, public opinion, and propaganda in the second part of our series.